Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our first uh, in-person DART Awards since 2019. We're really excited to be here. Uh, my name is Ariel Richin. I'm a journalist and documentary filmmaker, an alum of this school, and senior producer at the DART Center. Now, typically, you'd see our executive director, Bruce Shapiro, up here, but he has COVID. He's been promoted to the big screen, and here I am. <laughs> So you'll hear from me uh, now and again tonight. I'll also be moderating the panel later on but I, with our honorees. But I first wanted to just give Bruce an opportunity to welcome everybody from the comfort of his home office. Thank you, Ariel. Uh, and welcome, everyone. Uh, it is wonderful to be here, even if it's only virtual. Um, I want to welcome officially all of you to the 28th annual DART Awards for Excellence in Coverage of Trauma. Um, as Ariel said, this is our first in-person public event since 2019, which is sobering to think about. Um, it's good to see all of you here, but just because we all think we are done with COVID doesn't mean it's done with us, hence my my big brother presence and my lurking on Zoom along with the rest of the virtual audience who are watching this live streamed on YouTube um, after I'm done speaking now. Uh, for those of you who've never encountered the DART Center before, we are a project of Columbia Journalism School, um, uniquely dedicated, the only university center in the world dedicated to fostering innovation and excellence in the reporting on violence, crisis, and tragedy, as well as support for the journalists dedicated to this very challenging work. Um, we support newsroom training informed by trauma science, research, fellowships, and these awards. And we've done it uh, through the DART Awards since 1994 and the DART Center since uh, 1999. There's a lot of very difficult stuff happening in the world tonight, uh, this week, this year. All of us have felt the buffeting of extraordinary events in our own communities and around the world. But tonight we are here to celebrate. That may seem a strange verb, considering that tonight's awards honor stories of tragic loss and gaping psychic wounds disappearances in Mexico, health inequity in Los Angeles, police violence, forced migration, even a brutal gun assault on a local newsroom. These are difficult stories about difficult themes and difficult experiences. But the reporters, editors, and producers whose work you will meet tonight and who you will meet tonight in person confronted in these stories the most pressing issues facing our society with compassion, with journalistic rigor, with profound respect for survivors, with insistence on breaking silence around abuses and eloquent storytelling. And in a time of fake news, of denial of accountability at the highest levels of power, um, at a time of war and autocracy, that is a profound and even joyful commitment that does deserve both sober honor and celebration. Um, I, in the course of my work as executive director of the DART Center, spend a lot of time along with my colleagues in newsrooms, in person and virtually, with reporters, editors, and producers who are so often wondering if there is really a way to cover yet another mass shooting, yet another COVID wave, yet another act of gender violence or racism. Tonight's honorees give us the answer. They're a definitive pushback against despair, against homogenization and sensationalism in the news. Um, I spent a lot of time in journalism classrooms with students here at Columbia and elsewhere who wonder if any story, any reporting can really do justice to victims and survivors who wonder sometimes even if it's ever responsible to approach victims and survivors and try to narrate traumatic experiences. Tonight's honorees show the answer. 
They show it can be done with insight and ethics. Reporters can make choices informed by science and skill and a clear sense of mission. Um, the DART Awards, like the DART Center's other core activity, are supported with an extraordinary annual core gift by Kenneth B. Dart. We're here tonight to celebrate that generosity too, which has made such a contribution to the community of journalists worldwide. I wanna say a few things about the DART Awards, which as I said earlier, go back to 1994. By tradition, the DART Awards are a team prize. One of the things we realized very early on in setting up the first way, the first attempt to honor journalists who focus on victims and survivors of tragedy is that doing this work well, succeeding in attracting public attention is more than just the effort of a single reporter or a single photographer. It takes a newsroom wide, a news organization wide commitment to encourage the reporting that needs to be done and color within ethical lines. It takes extraordinary editing. It takes extraordinary design to do compelling work. And whether we're talking in um, traditional legacy newspapers, television stations, or an online outlet, that team requirement is still central to the DART Awards. The DART Awards are now a cross-platform prize. You will meet journalists tonight working in audio, working in documentary, working in long-form narrative writing. Um, tonight's evening, a few words on that, has a couple of elements. There is some ceremony, hopefully not too long. You are going to hear from two important colleagues. Uh, first, Columbia Journalism School Dean Jelani Cobb, and then Jim Lammers, who's chair of Dart Container Corporation. Both have a profound commitment to the mission of the Dart Center and the compassion, evidence-informed, and ethical reporting that you'll see tonight. You'll also see a presentation on this year's winners, which will be narrated by the DART Center's good friend, Sasha Pfeiffer, Pfeiffer, correspondent for NPR Investigations, who's devoted so much of her own career to reporting on this difficult terrain. We're glad to have Sasha here, both narrating the video and in person tonight in the audience. And then we'll get to the heart of the evening, a round table with DART Award winners going under the hood of this powerful work. A primary goal of the DART Award has always been not just an, another journalistic mutual backpack, but to share innovation, to share how great trauma-informed reporting is done to help the next generation, or indeed this generation of journalists, build one story on another on the kind of excellence you're seeing tonight. Um, you'll hear that roundtable in a conversation led by my colleague Ariel, who, along with being the DART Center's senior producer, directed this year's DART Awards. Um, at the bottom, tonight's honorees all share a deep commitment to difficult truths too often suppressed, whether suppressed through active censorship or suppressed through the difficulty sometimes of confronting traumatic experience among individuals, families, and communities. Um, I'd like to turn the podium now over to another journalist who's devoted himself to telling difficult truths and now is leading this school um, in that pursuit, uh, the journalism school's dean, Jelani Cobb. Jelani, over to you. Thank you, uh, Bruce, uh, for that baton pass. Um, it, it really uh, is a little bittersweet uh, that we are able to have everyone here uh, back uh, in person, uh, but not able to have you here with us. Uh, and so I have little that I can add to the really uh, profound summation uh, that Bruce Shapiro gave to the work of the DART Center. Uh, I can tell you this as dean, um, I moved from being a faculty member to being dean, that required a learning curve, learning a lot more about the work that my colleagues do uh, here at the journalism school uh, in, in many instances. 
It did not require much of a learning curve in terms of the DART Center, uh, because if I didn't know through my interactions uh, with uh, Bruce Shapiro and Kate Black, uh, and if I didn't know through having uh, sat on DART juries, I certainly would know through the frequent, common, consistent commentary that I get when I'm out in the world about the DART Center. Uh, you know, I've kind of notably quit Twitter um, this week or last week, um, start a whole bunch of conversations I didn't expect, um, but back in the era where I was on Twitter, I would get references, especially when, when large-scale tragedies would happen. Uh, people would cite things from the DART Center or tweet things from the DART Center. Uh, and so it's just uh, really edifying to see how the important work of this center uh, has impacted Columbia Journalism School, has impacted the journalism profession, and has impacted the, the much wider world. Uh, the only other thing that I will say in addition to this is that you know, I'm reminded of the quote from James Baldwin that not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. And this is the work, the honorable calling of journalism to face the things that have to be changed. And what the DART Center has done in its pioneering vision is to consider the consequences of the emotional uh, and psychological and, and spiritual consequences that facing the things that need to be changed incur for all of us. For those of us who, as journalists, chronicle these things, for those of us who live through uh, these situations, uh, and for the broader society. Uh, and so in that regard, I'm really uh, happy to be here uh, to welcome all of you. Uh, special congratulations uh, to the LA Times and to Atavist, uh, but also to uh, Vanity Fair and NPR and the Outlaw Ocean Project, which I will tell you definitively has the best name of any publication that I've ever like encountered. Uh, the Outlaw uh, Ocean, I, was like, I just thought like the Outlaw Josie Wales, that old uh, movie. Uh, and so um, congratulations to everyone and, um, and welcome. Thank you so much, Jelani. Uh, I'm now pleased to introduce a longtime ally, advocate, supporter of the DART Center and our work for more than 20 years now, Jim Lammers, who you heard Bruce mention, chairman of the board of the DART Container Corporation. Jim. Thanks, Ariel. Um, to show you what kind of a Luddite I am, I never was on Twitter, so there you have it. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here tonight. I, I wish Bruce was here. We had a couple conversations earlier today, the second of which was with uh, Jelani. Um, so it's been a very, very good day. Um, and uh, Bruce and I go all the way back um, to the very beginnings of the DART Center, uh, which had its uh, roots first at Michigan State University. Um, so we were a part of a, the Big Ten network. Then we moved out to the University of Washington in Seattle, and we were there, and that's when it first became named the DART Center. So we had some Pac-10 or 12 or whatever experience there. And then we came to Columbia quite some time ago, and um, we cannot think of a better home uh, for the DART Center than at Columbia. And I just want to um, briefly thank um, all of the DART staff. Um, Bruce, uh, I think, captured it very, very well in his opening comments um, tonight, and I really treasured the relationship that uh, we and I have had um, with Bruce, and I can assure you, it, from my perspective, the DART Center is in incredibly good hands. And Kate and Ariel and um, um, you know, all, all, all the others, uh, Alana and Isabel, um, have done a wonderful job. The, uh, there are so many faces of the DART Center, um, and it just sort of is like a, a, a math equation that just gets bigger and bigger. And those faces <clears throat> include, obviously, not just the members of the DART staff, but all of the um, fellows who have gone through the um, dart Ockberg Fellowship Program, working journalists who've gone through that program, all of the people who in the news organizations who have been trained, um, 
on uh, issues that are relevant to, uh, to their beats and their self-care and, and, and excellence in coverage. Um, and of course, all the DART Award winners. And I want to echo what Jelani said. It's a great honor um, to be here among the winners this evening, both the winners and the honorable mention. Uh, mentioned um, candidates um, and winners. The work you do is incredibly important. I was reminded of that uh, just you know coming up here. Uh, I think it's Francine uh, from the Los Angeles Times, who is I uh, is the photographer, came up and introduced herself. We had a wonderful conversation, and you know just hearing from her about sort of being in the belly of the beast on um, um, COVID-related coverage and tsunami coverage and the riots 30 years ago in LA um, were all sort of vivid reminders of, of the importance of the work. I mean, obviously, as, as Bruce said, I, I think the DART Center um, has never been more important than it is now. That's sad that that's the case, but it is the case. And I know from talking with Kate and Bruce and others that the, the demands on the DART Center um, are heavy. Um, and they've been doing, a, I think, a Herculean job in terms of responding to those demands, in terms of training um, and um, the, uh, the other matters that, uh, that they deal with. So I guess, um, you know, in closing, I, I uh, shared with Bruce this morning um, and with um, Jelani this afternoon that we're going to continue our support. Um, we've been at it uh, in, for 28 years now. Um, and we're going to be providing $2.7 million over the next years uh, to continue the core support of um, the DART Center. And uh, it's uh, something that is uh, very important um, to, to Ken and to all of us. And I just want to thank all of you, the award winners and the staff, for a job exceedingly well done. Thanks. That's really great news. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you, Jim. Thank you, Jackie. Uh, I wanted to thank Sasha Pfeiffer again, who collaborated with me on the uh, Dart Awards video that you guys will see as we move into uh, an awards celebration. Uh, we'll be hearing from Sasha on the big screen shortly. And with that, um, let's start celebrating. Uh, we'll start with our honorable mentions. Um, the first honorable mention goes to Vanity Fair. Vanity Fair received an honorable mention for They Were Sons. In it, 15 surviving mothers tell the stories of their children, all of whom were killed by police. Judges praised the project for painting, quote, a full picture of the men who died and what it means to lose them, and for showing the reader the human-shaped holes in the lives of their mothers. Our judges called it powerful first-person storytelling, unfiltered and unvarnished, and commended its ability to capture pride and pain at the same time. They said it provided a sense of all that lingers for families after the headlines and social media outrage passes. And they applauded Rita Amoka's self-effacement and courage. They called her work a profound exercise of journalistic responsibility and an act of refusal of the easy reporting path. Claire Lansbaum will be accepting the award on behalf of Vanity Fair. being the first one, there's no trend to follow. Um, <laughs> I would just say um, many, many, many kudos to Rita, who pitched this story to me um, while I was an editor at Vanity Fair, and to Vanity Fair's photography team, who sent a fleet of photographers across the country to capture the portraits that you just saw. Thank you. Uh, 
Our next honorable mention is the best named publication of all time, The Outlaw Ocean Project. هذا البحر الازرق اللي الناس بتتغنى فيه اتحول لمقبره The Outlaw Ocean Project received an honorable mention for the secretive prisons that keep migrants out of Europe. It investigates the European Union's shadow immigration system that sends African migrants to brutal Libyan detention centers. Judges describe this project as an incredible, daring feat of journalism. They said it took us to the heart of a huge policy issue, uncovering details of abuse and holding authorities to account. They commended the reporting team for zeroing in on a governmental entity that can do violence to so many people while also zooming out to the climate migration crisis, one of the biggest stories of our time. Joe Sexton and Ed U, if you'd like to come up as well to accept the award. Don't be scared that I'm opening the paperwork. The, uh, <clears throat> thank you so much. Um, I accept this honor on behalf of the whole Outlaw Ocean family, uh, those who were with us in Libya and on the Mediterranean, those back home who worked with our families and the U.S. State Department to win our release after our abduction. More important is the need to thank those men and women who shared their stories with us at risk of their lives some of whom paid a fearsome price for their honesty and daring. I thought I'd use my quick moment here to share a poem. What can I tell you? It's a thing. As a young, feckless 19-year-old, I got drunk one night in Dublin with the great Irish poet Seamus Heaney. He was 15 years away from winning the Nobel Prize for Literature, and I was, well, a feckless 19-year-old. Heaney would later write a poem on the 25th anniversary of the founding of Amnesty International. We relied heavily on the fine and brave work Amnesty International has done in Libya, documenting what the United Nations has now declared to be crimes against humanity, all done in the name of the European Union. The poem, which is not long, uh, reminds us, journalists and others, uh, that we are each dual citizens ambassadors for life, for a simpler, more principled world. From the Republic of Conscience. When I landed in the Republic of Conscience, it was so noiseless when the engine stopped, I could hear a curlew high above the runway. At immigration, the clerk was an old man who produced a wallet from his homespun coat and showed me a photograph of my grandfather. The woman in customs asked me to declare the words of our traditional cures and charms to heal dumbness and avert the evil eye. No porters, no interpreter, no taxi. You carried your own burden, and very soon your symptoms of creeping privilege disappeared. Fog is a dreaded omen there, but lightning spells universal good, and parents hang swaddled infants in trees during thunderstorms. Salt is their precious mineral, and seashells are held to the ear during births and funerals. The base of all inks and pigments is seawater. Their sacred symbol is a stylized boat. The sail is an ear, the mast a sloping pen, the hull a mouth shape, the keel an open eye. At their inauguration, public leaders must swear to uphold unwritten law and weep to atone for their presumption to hold office. And to affirm their faith, 
that all life sprang from salt in tears, which the sky god wept after he dreamt his solitude was endless. I came back from that frugal republic with my two arms the one length. The customs woman, having insisted my allowance, was myself. The old man rose and gazed into my face and said that was official recognition, that I was now a dual citizen. He therefore desired me when I got home to consider myself a representative and to speak on their behalf in my own tongue. Their embassies, he said, were everywhere, but operated independently, and no ambassador would ever be relieved. Thanks so much. Our final honorable mention, we'd like to celebrate NPR's Embedded Podcast. This is going to be a story for how many days? Less than a week. People will forget about us after a week. NPR received an honorable mention for A Damn Paper, an episode of the Embedded podcast. It features reporters who survived the attack on the Capital Gazette newspaper in Maryland. A gunman murdered five people there in 2018. I just just don't know what I want right now, right? But I'm going to need more than a couple days of news coverage and some thoughts and prayers because it's our whole lives have been shattered. I appreciate the prayers. I was praying the entire time I was under that desk. I want your prayers, but I want something else. Judges called the episode a masterpiece of trauma-informed journalism. They said it cuts right to the heart and helps listeners understand the real impact of violence directed at this profession and at the democratic institution. They praised the team's persistent, careful, and caring touch, as well as its straightforward, unblinking approach from the reporting, to the language choices, to the structure, to the ways it demystifies local news. Chris Benderev, Lisa Pollack. I will be very brief. I don't have a poem, unfortunately. Um, But um, I just want to thank all of the people whose pictures and names were up there who helped me make the thing. It is very much a team sport. Uh, I also want to thank the Capitol uh, Gazette newspaper, um, especially um, Josh McCaro and Celine Sanfelice, who um, talked a lot about their own trauma in that episode. Um, the Capitol is still like an extremely under-resourced paper, actually a lot more under-resourced than when we started the, the whole story back in 2018. Uh, and I will thank uh, my wife, who built our son's crib herself eight months pregnant uh, while we were finishing these episodes. So anyway, thank you. Our first Start Award winner, the Los Angeles Times. The Los Angeles Times received the DART Award for Disease, Inequity, and Resilience in South LA. It portrays the ravages of the pandemic during the Delta surge. Judges praise this reporting team for shining a light on compounding tragedies and unfairnesses and putting together a riveting package of love and loss in the face of adversity. They applauded Joe Mazingo for the depth of his reporting and for refusing to describe his subjects as victims and instead portraying them as warriors who are fighting hard battles, whether it's against COVID-19 or structural racism. 
They also hailed the compassion, care, and visual power of Francine Orr's photography. And they said, it's clear how hard this reporting duo worked to gain the trust of the hospitals and their sources, whom they depicted as heroes of stories that are about survival. I'm not prepared to uh, talk this evening, so please bear with me. Do we have any students in the audience? I'm speaking directly to you then. So 30 years ago, I, I was an intern with my friend um, Julie Brown Harwood, and the LA, the LA riots happened in 92. My very first assignment for the LA Times that I did, I mucked it up. I didn't get great images when I was an intern. My first assignment, I was sent out to take a portrait of a woman that had lost everything during the, during the riot. And she started to cry. And I stopped, I waited for her to compose herself. And then I took the portrait. I was very proud of myself for my compassion. And I took my information, my, my portrait, back to my photo editor. And um, she looked at my work and she was angry at me because I had failed. I messed up my first assignment for the LA Times. She said to me, cry if you must, but take the damn picture. And I've been trying to do that ever since. Journalists must be compassionate. They must be caring. They be, must be honest. But we also have to have access to stories. We have to have great narrative r reporters like Joe Mazingo, we must have photo editors like Rob St. John. Um, Hector Becerra was the word editor on this piece. Um, I have to just say thank you to those people. Um, I just want to say also thank you to all the people that allowed us to tell their stories when they were in the most vulnerable situations of their lives. Not only the patients, the few family members that we witnessed, but also all the doctors, and nurses. Truth matters, journalism matters, and um, I hope that you would look at me as an example, as a student. Um, just keep working hard, just keep motivated, just keep um, practicing journalism. And I'm so incredibly honored to receive this award along with my colleague, um, Joe Mazingo. Thank you. And our final dart award, uh, the atavists. La primera vez que fui a búsqueda, pues no sabíamos qué identificar un olor ni nada, pero como todo el tiempo he estado en, en el campo, sé identificar los olores de la tierra húmeda, seca, y sé identificar también el olor de la tierra a un olor diferente. Y se sabe el olor de un animal al de un ser humano no es el mismo olor, pero si sí son olores fuertes, pues, pero se identifican y en eso escarbamos y encontramos un tesoro. Entonces yo dije, si este olor tiene la tierra que tiene un cuerpo o otra cosa, pues tenemos que identificar los olores. The Atavist received the Dart Award for A Feast for Lost Souls. It tells the story of a woman-led collective of trackers searching for the remains of their loved ones, the disappeared of Mexico. And it shows how these survivors live with loss through incredible action. Judges describe it as a deeply moving piece that stirs our collective empathy and gives voice to the unspeakable. They praised writer Annalise Jolly and photographer Zahara Gomez Lucini for letting their subjects grieve and breathe in their own time and for providing the reader with a real connection to their pain. Zahara Gomez Lucini, Saber Darby, and Lens Clark. Come on up. Um, 
Hello, I'm Sayward Darby, the editor of The Atavist. Um, and uh, this is such an honor. The Atavist is an incredibly small operation. I'm the only full-time staff member. Um, and so I really rely on the incredible work of so many freelancers, Zahara, Lenz, Annalise, who couldn't be here tonight, who wrote the amazing story that accompanied Zahara's gorgeous videos and photography. Um, and so thank you to them for bringing this idea to us and trusting the atavist um, to do justice to it. Um, and I've never met the women in this incredible project, but I, every time I, and I've seen these videos so many times, and every time I feel my, my breath catch because these women are incredible. And Zahara and Annalise did an amazing job of showing their agency. Um, not just the fact that they had suffered incredible loss, but the ways that they were seeking to repair their lives, understanding that they might never be whole again, but that there were ways that they could repair them. Um, and what was not shown in, in that particular video is that a huge feature of what they do is they cook. And they cook the food that was loved by the people they lost. And the through line of the entire story is about community, about family, um, and about breaking bread for those who can no longer do it for themselves. And um, an incredible side sort of aspect of this is that you can actually buy the cookbook um, of these women's recipes that um, are dedicated to the loved ones that they've lost, and in some cases found their treasures, as they, they call these bodies. So it's a multifaceted project. I'm so proud to have been a part of it, and I am so honored that the uh, DART Center saw fit to, to give us this award. So thank you so much. All right, so we're now going to be moving into a uh, panel discussion with our honorees. So if all of the panelists could make their way up here, everyone else, you can grab a drink, move a little bit closer, fill those seats. We want it to be a conversation, and we'll just be starting in a, in a couple of minutes to get under the hood of these projects. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> 